say at least good morning here in Europe um, and uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon uh, in Asia. I'm Raymond van Holder. Uh, I'm uh, a retired nephrologist from Ghent in Belgium and I'm chairing this session, which will be um, very interesting, I think. Uh, at the same time, uh, I must say that we are the first probably to test live this system and um, uh, we are some sort of guinea pig, so we are uh, just uh, making a tryout and uh, we can see how uh, nicely it works. Um, thanks to Jaffron International uh, for, um, in, uh, for organizing this symposium with very interesting topics, I think, uh, starting with an interesting clinical study um, and randomized control trial that has been undertaken in China. Then uh, an Italian uh, study on uh, uremic toxins, which are, of course, also very important uh, topics. And finally, um, uh, something else that concerns us all, which is uh, hemoperfusion, or more exactly COVID-19, and um, the cytokine storm uh, from which uh, the patients uh, are suffering. Um, without further ado, and asking the speakers to keep as much as possible to the time lots that they have been allotted, I would like to invite uh, as a first speaker, uh, Dr. Gengru Jiang uh, from uh, Shanghai um, with um, its uh, presentation on this randomized open label trial on hemoperfusion, which is interesting because it is considering uh, not only uh, mortality and cardiovascular morbidity, which is of course very important to our patients, but also um, their quality of life. So now I give the word uh, to Dr. Jiang. Okay, uh, Professor Renhold, thank you very much for the introduction. Background, we know the number of end-stage renal disease patients were exceed 5.4 million in 2000. Today, globally, which places a heavy economic burden. There are about 0 0.8 million end stage renal disease patients in mainland of China. The all cause mortality rate is higher in humanized patients aged over 65 years in cardiovascular disease accounts for the major cause of death cases. So we designed a clinical trial to evaluate the effect of hemodiasis of hemoperfusion therapy on maternity led cardiovascular events in the rough quality in maternity hemodialysis patients. The trial is a randomized open label peri-group multi-center study, which handed by Tsinghua Hospital affiliated to Shanghai Jotong University School of Medicine through the Dalit centers in Shanghai participated in this trial. The trial lasted for five years and 1,407 patients were enrolled patients in the control arm received two to three hemodialysis or hemodialysis filtration therapy each week, while patients in the hemoperfusion arm received an extra treatment of hemoperfusion every two weeks. The trial is registered in Chinese clinical trial registry. Patients aged 18 to 75 who have two years of dialysis history and receive two to three times of hemodialysis or hemodialysis filtration treatment per week. 
four to five hours each time. And with the cathedral V more than 1.2 in the latest eight weeks were enrolled. All patients signed the formal consent. Patients with low rough expectancy, low white blood cell or platelet in a history of, of cerebral hemorrhage or masses in the past eight weeks, etc. were excluded. All patients receive a four week regular blood, blood purification treatment before intervention. At week four, 12, 24, 48, 72, and 96 days of the visit. Blood samples and the primary endpoint all cause motility, secondary endpoint. Cardiovascular mortality, major cardiovascular events, and the quality of life were recorded. Kaplan Mayo method, followed by the log leg test, was used in analyzing the primary out outcome. Mutual variate, variate Cox regression was used to analyze the factors that could influence all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality after the adjustment for multiple relevant traditional and eliminate related risk factors for mortality. There are 142 drop of cases. 87 in hemoperfusion arm, 55 in control arm. The main reason for the drop off are contact lost, transplant, and patient quit, and adverse events. <clears throat> All cause mortality in him, in him, skin profusion arm start to reduce significantly since 24 weeks and the mortality gap between the two groups increased gradually over time. Baby perfusion therapy can significantly reduce all cause mortality. Cardiovascular mortality in hemo perfusion group, group was 37% lower than that in control compared with the control um, cardiovascular mortality in every perfusion group decreased significantly from 24 weeks. So every perfusion therapy can significantly reduce cardiovascular mortality. New or recurrent cardiovascular events in him perfusion group was significantly lower than lose in the control group. Events number in hemoperfusion arm is 6.25% and 9.39% in control. Long-term regret hemoperfusion therapy can reduce new or recurrent cardiovascular events and effectively prevent and treat treat cardiovascular complications in dialysis patients. After 90, 96 weeks of treatment, the increase of scores in symptoms and discomfort, cognitive location, and social support in hemoperfusion arm were significantly higher than lose in control group. After 96 weeks of treatment, the overall scores increase of lower physical body pain, general health, 
low emotional and SF36 total scores in the female population arm was significantly higher than those in control group. But are two microglobin in human pure fusion group, group decreased significantly after 48 in 96 weeks of treatment. The decrease of beta 2 microglobin in human pure fusion group was significantly higher than that in control group after 96 weeks of treatment. The intact Pyrethroid hormone in control group increased after 96 weeks, while hemoperfusion group reduced 47.72 picogram per meal. There was no significant difference in blood lutein liver function blood lipid and blood sugar between the groups before and after treatment. So, conclusion, all cause mortality rate in the hemopure fusion group decreased by 37% compared to the control group. In the hemopure fusion group, the all cause mortality is 7.53%, while in the control, it is 11.95%. Cardiovascular mortality rate decreased by 37% compared to the control group. The neural emerging or re emerging cardiovascular events led in the hemoperfusion group was significantly lower than those in the control group. Hemoperfusion group had a significantly higher increase in symptoms and discomfort, cognitive function and social support than the control group. So, uh, hemoperfusion group had a significantly higher increase in lower physical body pain, general health, lower emotion, and SF36 that the control group. The hemoperfusion group had a more significant decrease in beta 2 microglobin and the intact pyrethroid hormone than the control group. There was no significant difference in the change of blood, routine, liver, function, lipid, and blood sugar level before and after the treatment between the two groups. So uh, there was a significant difference. HD, FP, will become the potential new treatment modality for maternal hemodialysis patients. We proved that hemodialysis combined the hemoperfusion treatment reduced cardiovascular events, all cause and cardiovascular deaths in maternal hemodialysis patients. Our feature plan is to expand the inclusion criteria to increase the external validity and test more. Uh, indicators. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang, for this uh, interesting and uh, beautiful talk and uh, for staying so well within your uh, time limits. Uh, we will hold the discussion only after the, um, the last speaker. Um, if there are any questions, you can ask them then, or you can ask them also by writing. Um, and uh, without uh, waiting further, we can now move to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Vincenzo Panicchi from Italy, um, who has been studying 
the removal of protein-bound uremic toxins in dialysis patients using this hemoperfusion system. So, uh, Dr. Paniki, uh, you have the, the the floor, or the, at least the virtual floor. Okay. This is my first slide. You can recognize it, I believe, Professor Van Older. It is a very historical slide in which the classification of non-uremic toxin is done. We have three mainly groups, small water soluble solutes, middle molecules named beta-2 microglobulin and protein down solutes, principal indole sulfate and peak results that are the, uh, the today, uh, I am going to speak about this today. Okay, this is, this uremic toxins are non-covalently binded to albumin and 80, 90% of these are uh, are binded to albumin via a pseudo site to uh, albumin binding site. As you know, this uremic toxin concentration are inversely related to renal function and are going to increase in stage five and particularly they are going to increase in patients receiving regular hemodialysis. Uh, either for indoxyl sulfate and peak result. And mainly this uh, uh, P boots that are called protein binding uremic toxins are 40 times and 20 times higher in patient uh, suffering from renal kidney disease in respect of healthy subject, healthy control. Next slide. But renal residual renal function is one of the main uh, effector of protein bound uh, toxins removal. And so you can see that the residual renal function may attempt for 40% capability of the individual to remove uh, uremic toxins, even in the later stage of renal disease. But of course, renal transplantation is the best way to remove renal uh, uh, protein bind uremic toxin. Here you can see that patient before and not transplanted and after transplantation, how the, the uremic toxin are decreasing in the plasma. And this is a, a time course study where after one month and 12 months, uremic toxin were markedly reduced after a successful renal transplantation. Okay, why P-boots are so dangerous? Mainly because they are associated with a short renal survival. You can see in this paper, patient with a higher level of uremic toxin were undergoing a very quick deterioration of renal function in respect of patient with lower level. But moreover, patient are subjected to associated mortality with P-boots level. And this was firstly uh, uh, established in this paper published in 206 by Bammers and co-workers where serum levels of protein bound uremic toxins are associated with mortality in patient treated with HD. This year, the problem is a missing link between uh, cardiorenal syndrome the role of protein bound uremic toxins that are going to, uh, to produce impaired renal function through renal fibrosis and also cardiac fibrosis. And these toxins are due to atherosclerosis, vascular stiffness, and calcification. But moreover, several mechanisms have been proposed. One, this is a classical one, uremic toxins are due to systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, and endothelial dysfunction, and so going to produce cardiovascular disease in our population. This is one newer one where the role of NFKB is elucidated, is going to produce the increased level of TGF1 beta, and furthermore, renal tubo interstitial fibrosis and glomerulosclerosis. So we have, different types of therapeutic strategies going to reduce uh, and reduce levels. Gut synthesis reduced, uh, gastrointestinal sequestration, reduced prostomer tubular retention, but I'm going to spend the few minutes that I have living in renal replacement therapies. As you know, renal re standard hemodialysis is going to 
produce a 30% reduction rate of our uremic toxins, but we are not satisfied. So we are trying to do better and to use uh, different technique, dialysis technique, uh, in order to increase this depuration. So we have extended dialysis. We are trying to increase time from four to four to eight hours and change the method from standard hemodialysis to hemodia filtration. And so you can see that the eight hour hemodia filtration is more efficient in respect of a four hour standard hemodialysis in removing uremic toxins. Of course, nocturnal dialysis is more effective because it's a longer therapeutic uh, strategy. So here again, reduction of, of uh, uremic toxic levels. You, you can also change and increase dialysis flow on the dialysis surface area. And so we have uh, here again an increasing in uh, uremic toxins removal. We can also add a sorbent to the dialysate and we can double redu uh, reduction of uremic toxins. We can use combative strategies that are more efficient in reducing indoxyl sulfate and unpeak results levels. Either in post, pre or pre H this technique, post hemodia filtration, pre hemodia filtration, pre hemo filtration, you can see there is uh, some little difference in uh, this reduction. This is what is a uh, paper that we have published a few years ago where hemodia filtration, high volume hemodia filtration, is a change volumes, volumes over 23 liters per session was able at after six months of reducing H ES free levels and total levels. So MO dialysis via diffusion and convection is good, but it's not probably enough. We are looking for trying to increase our capability during the dialysis treatment in uh, removing uremic toxins. So we can use adsorption, the third main uh, mechanism that is used in, in, uh, in standard replacement therapy. So this is uh, the definition of absorption. We have blood plasma that is going on a cartridge and we can perfume the blood, entire blood of plasma that have been separated through a palma filter. This is here again the principle of adsorption. Several principles have been used by affinity and obesity, molecular sieve, physical interaction, even to antibody antigen interaction. So it's a very complex mechanism of perfusion that is. Uh, uh, consists in the passage of anticoagulate whole blood through a device that contains aspirin particle. This is a cartridge that we have used. There are three types of this cartridge. It's uh, made of a styrene, divibenyl, benzene, copolymer, and this has a chemical in, uh, uh, characteristic of this uh, cartridge that is indicated for long term dialysis patient in chronic use and is going to reduce the hypertension, microinflammation and malnutrition. This is a main remove the molecular range and the capability of the resin. These are a few papers that have been published. This is a paper of Chen where they studied where during two years a random prospective randomized parallel control and analysis of 100 patients. After two years of follow-up, you can see that PRC, interleukin-6, and beta-2 microglobulin is reduced in patients receiving the cartridge. But you have to note this graphic because it takes at least one year to have some reduction because in the first point, six months, no reduction was obtained. And this is another paper, historical paper of Lin, where three groups were compared in order to avoid the pruritus score and parathyroid calcium phosphate product. This is our pilot study from Italy, is very, very pilot. Observation and randomized studied, and we 
investigate the potential effect of this cartridge used in perfusion in patients suffering from severe itching, 17 patients. Hemodialysis alone was compared with hemodialysis plus hemoperfusion twice a week for the first week and once a week for the following seven weeks. And this is the method that we have tried to examine. This is the dialytic technique, and this is a schematic representation of the circuit that uh, uh, you know very well, uh, the cartridge, uh, hemodialyzer, blood pump, and stimulation, and so on. No particular difference from dialytic efficiency were, uh, uh, were shown after two months of therapy. This is plasma beta-2 mycoglobulin that is reduced, uh, slightly reduced in uh, patients receiving cartridge. And this is a KT overview where there is no problem. Very high KT overview was achieved in both the technique. Uh, we observed, however, after two months, a significant reduction in the sulfate and peak results in patients receiving the cartridge in uh, hemoperfusion. This is a itching scale, vast itching scale, where a slight but not significant reduction was obtained in patients receiving the cartridge. Two months is a very short time, I remember you. This is a, a very, very uh, recent paper that you have heard before. This is a, a, a picture of the lecturer that have written now been published regarding this topic. And the last one, my conclusion, that this is a, a, adequacy should not be more based only on KT over Vuria, but should be considered the kinetic via retention salute that are associated with clinical adverse outcomes. Of course, preserved kidney function is of primary importance. Absorption plus hemodialysis or hemodiafiltration can be a good therapeutic option. And the combination of upstream therapy, reduction of intestinal production, and downstream strategy, renal replacement therapy is the best approach. Sorry for the technical problem and thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Panicki. Thank you also for staying well in time. We are still even slightly ahead of our schedule. Um, and now, uh, without discussion, we move to the last speaker of this uh, session, um, who is uh, Dr. Um, Srizavat from uh, Thailand, um, I guess from no, Chula Longkorn. So I think that is not Bangkok, or it is Bangkok. Um, and um, uh, no, Chula Longkorn is apparently a king. Um, and he is going to tell us something of, our, of a problem that is concerning all of us and bothering all of us. It's COVID-19, and COVID-19 is associated with a cytokine storm. Uh, so we are interested to hear what absorption would do to this problem. Dr. Srizalat, you have the floor. Uh, th thank you, Professor Van Hoda, and uh, uh, for a kind introduction. And thank you, Jeffron, for, uh, for, for the invitation for me to share our experience to use the hemoperfusion in severe COVID-19. So uh, this is the outline of my presentation. The cytokine storm or the stage of like the immunodysregulation still have not a clear definition, but uh, this process is the, the process that you have like a massive activation of the immune system. Uh, you have a massive release of uh, the cytokine that was probably activation by the, the, the T cell, B cell and uh, macrophage. When you have a cytokine storm in, uh, for example, in severe COVID-19, you will present like a, have a high fever that normally will persist, normally more persist more than a week. You're gonna have like a, a coughing, shortness of breath, or fatigue and body pain. Some laboratory can suggest uh, the cytokine storm condition, like a high elevation of LDH, ferritin, CRP, ESR, and also the elevation of the cytokine. 
uh, and the result of the cytokine storm can cause the not only in the lung that causes ARDS, but it's also lead into multiple organ dysfunction, including the cardiovascular instability, uh, abnormal coagulation, and also the severe acute kidney injury and massive leakage of the fluid. The cytokine storm in uh, COVID-19 actually is not a new one. Previously in, in the era of SARS or MERS also have uh, the, the evidence to support the, uh, the presence of the cytokine storm. In the cytokine storm, normally it's happened after the first week as that is the time, this is a dead study from China that clearly show that uh, the, the timing that we should suspect about the cytokine storm normally apparent after one week. Another study also from China in Lancet also that the timing of the, uh, that we should suspect about the cytokine storm happened after the first week. Until the present time, we don't have a clear um, uh, pathway of the cytokine storm. Normally, this is like a schematic diagram to propose that after you have the SARS-CoV virus infection, they will have a activation of some uh, uh, inflammatory cell and lead to the cytokine production and lead to the multiple organ injury. And which cytokine play a role? Um, this is a study also from China that showed that uh, like a 40 cytokine panel and show that in the severe COVID-19 cases, you will have an uh, elevation of uh, some specific cytokine like uh, IL-2, 7, GMCSF, interferon gamma, MCT, MIT-1, and TNF-alpha. This is look like the clinical of the, the stage that we call secondary um, hemophagocytosis. So this is a cytokine that might play a role during the uh, severe COVID-19 cytokine storm. One of the potential cell that was activated and discussed a lot during the past few months is a macrophage. In the macrophage, uh, uh, when there was activating, we call MAS or macrophage activating syndrome. You will have uh, engulfment of uh, red blood cell and also the platelet. You also have a massive release of the ferritin. And normally in this kind of the treatment, including the steroid, IVIG, and also you have a, like a second line and third line treatment. Uh, actually in the macrophage activating syndrome, it's not uh, the same uh, presentation like in the COVID-19. When you look into COVID-19, mainly the pathology is in the lung, but in the macrophage activating syndrome, you, you can see a lot of patients who have a, uh, peripheral organ injury and present like a hepatosplenomegaly. So still have some different and not the same uh, uh, pathway. What is the rationale to use the extracorporeal purification or EBP in uh, COVID-19 patients? As you may know that during the severe COVID-19 patient, you will have a stage of high pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, as I mentioned before, and you also have the high anti-inflammatory response that we can express by testing the HLA-DR or chemotaxis activity. And both of them can make the worsening to our uh, organ function. And the EBP that we're talking about can uh, reduce the cytokine, that the one that in the plus uh, signal. And after you remove more the cytokine, you will improve the cell function represented by the red uh, oval color that can move to the infected site better and you can control the inflammation and also the infection better. And we call this theory uh, cytokinetic theory. And so, and also this kind of the technique can uh, improve like a neutrophil chemotaxis activity. This is our data uh, published uh, two years ago that showed that after the chemoprofession technique, you can have an improve of the uh, immunosuppression by improved HLA-DR expression. Uh, recent uh, review article by Professor Ronko showed that the 
um, the hemoperfusion technique can cut down the peak of the cytokine and also can improve the uh, organ injury. Uh, what are the EBP techniques that are available in COVID-19 patients? This is the list of the current device that we have. One of the potential devices is, is uh, the hemoperfusion, we call the HA330, which is composite of uh, neutral resin and mainly absorb the cytokine like the uh, AR6. Uh, and this is a part way that you can apply the, the hemoperfusion. At the early stage, maybe this is a stage prominent of the vibemia, that you may apply some uh, hemoperfusion that can absorb the virus. And after that, in the severe COVID-19 case, you, call, you can also, in the state of the cytokine strong, and you may apply this kind of a treatment, or even the state that you enter into multiple organ dysfunction. This all, and uh, many of the cases requiring the renal support, but you can also think about to use uh, cytokine hemoperfusion to uh, control the cytokine strong also. Uh, what is the clinical and biological criteria that you uh, can use for initiation, monitoring, and discontinue the EBP? Uh, this is also the slide from our, uh, right now we have the uh, ongoing the, uh, meeting in the group of we call the ACI meeting or acute dialysis quality initiative. This is a meeting that uh, including all the experts in the field and we are planning to launch some recommendation uh, very soon in the next few weeks. In this meeting, we propose the criteria that we can use for guiding about the think about to use a hemoperfusion. This is all the clinical that we propose, including the high temperature, high sofa score, and also you can use some uh, uh, conventional laboratory like a lymphopenia, high ferritinemia, and also the high uh, LDH. In terms of the biomarker, we also propose that you may think about to use like an LR6 uh, or the, some monocyte function marker to represent the, the marker for uh, initiation and monitoring hemoperfusion. In our institute, we have a uh, chance to test the uh, hemoperfusion by using the HA330 uh, in the setting of a severe COVID-19 patient. And this is the setting that we use. We use the blood flow rate around 120 to 150, two time session for two consecutive days. And each session using around four hours. Uh, and the standard coagulant, anticoagulant, we use a heparin. This is all three cases. Well, all of them receive the antiviral regimen, but still have a worsening of the pulmonary function. We can see that the the PF ratio or the, or the oxygenation index that should normally higher like a four or 500. But in this kind of work, COVID-19, you will have a below 300. And this is the, the PF ratio uh, from the start to the end of the treatment. And for the patient one also have a, a improvement of the PF ratio and after the treatment and finally get the extubation. And this may take uh, a little bit time for, for the improvement. The second case also showed the improvement after the hemoperfusion and finally get extubation. The third case, you can see that the PF ratio not much change, but uh, finally the patients get improved and got uh, uh, extubation also. And this is a cytokine panel that we measure. Also, the cytokine panel, this is about a 13 panel. And the IL6 is one of the key cytokine that we measure. And you can see the reducing of the IL6 after uh, the treatment in two cases and not much change in the last case. This is the X-ray show the, uh, the, the, in, the infiltration and after the, the treatment um, to session, there are some uh, improvement of the radiologic uh, improvement. This is a radiography for case number two and number three. So the outcome of these three cases, they all survived and they also got uh, extubation. 
So in my conclusion, so uh, cytokine storm is one of the serious complication in uh, severe COVID-19. Until the present time, we still don't have a clear mechanism. And the EPP uh, from the rationale that we have and propose is one of the potential treatment that we use to uh, mitigate or to control the, the cytokine storm and prevent the organ dysfunction. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srisavap, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, we were well in time for discussion. Um, I don't know um, whether questions can be asked by the audience uh, orally that we can hear them, or otherwise they are also, it is possible to ask the questions um, with the, uh, by writing, I guess, and then I see it in my window. So are there any questions from the audience? Um, if not, um, I have a few questions for each of the speakers. I will do them one by one. Um, the first one is for Dr. Jiang. Um, I guess that the study was not blinded um, because that would be very difficult. And the question is, of course, in how far uh, being unblinded has influenced the results, especially uh, regarding your quality of life study. Is this okay? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Verhold. Uh, it's a very important question. Our trial is not blinded because hemiperfusion is a device that could be either uh, observed by patients or doctors, which made it hard to design a double blind trial. However, in my point of view, ind indicators like cognitive vocation and the social support are objective, which could not be either affected by open design. However, other subject indicators of quality of life may indeed be affected. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this uh, clear answer. Uh, then uh, for Dr. Paniki, I first want to make a remark um, because, of course, paracrisol uh, is no more to be accepted as a uremic toxin. Um, we all know now that it is transformed into a conjugate paracrisol sulfate. That doesn't make uh, much of a difference if paracrisol is measured. Uh, actually, this is a surrogate for paracrisyl sulfate, but it would make a difference in experimental studies uh, because there, uh, paracrisyl has a completely different effect uh, uh, compared to paracrisyl sulfate. So you may have seen that in literature, uh, the term uh, paracrisyl has largely disappeared since about, uh, yeah, I think it's 10 years. Um, so could you just clarify whether you really measured paracrisol or paracrisol sulfate? Uh, you are, of course, right, because you are the teacher of all us uh, regarding uremic toxins. So uh, the uremic toxins have been performed by IPLC in the University of Turin, and we have made the, the right one, I believe. Okay. Are you still there? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. And then the, the second question is what about um, the long-term effect? Um, uh, I mean, uh, eight weeks, I think uh, you're right. Uh, it was very short. To, yes. So do you think it makes uh, sense uh, to prolong, uh, to make a longer trial? And the other question is, of course, um, what kind of... Uh, uh, parameters that you use, can you m maybe use uh, some other parameters or measurement tools 
as well. Okay. Uh, I have said before, two, uh, two months is a very short period. It's too short, probably, because there is no enough time to, to look at the changement. So I would like to perform a larger trial with a larger number of patients and a longer observation time. And moreover, I have been very interested in trying to uh, look at what this can uh, uh, happen uh, adding hemodialysis or hemodiafiltration to the cartridge because most of the study have done in hemodialysis, but we have not done high volume hemodiafiltration. So it would be nice for me to look at the combined effect of either hemodialysis, standard hemodialysis, or high volume hemodiafiltration in removing this kind of uh, uremic toxins. Okay. Um, I think uh, that's right. It would be interesting to um, go further uh, in this uh, uh, question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paniki. Um, then um, I think we can uh, move to Dr. Um, uh, uh, Surizawap. Um, and I, we got also two questions from the audience, um, actually. Uh, one from uh, Francesco and one from Maria. Um, and uh, they are both a little bit in the same sense. The first question was, um, what is your standard timing to uh, perform hemoperfusion? And uh, Maria is then asking whether it would make sense to uh, prolong uh, the sessions. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot read the rest of the line. Uh, wait a minute. Now I have it uh, completely. If I move a little bit. Um, okay. Do you did you hear the question, Doctor Srisavap? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Van Hoder. So I think for the the timing, uh, I think we still don't have uh, like a. Uh, a strong evidence for the recommendation, but in the clinical practice, we apply this kind of treatment when the patient getting worse after the uh, the the like a antiviral treatment, and you have a declining of the uh, pulmonary function. So, like a, you have like a desaturation and the PF ratio less than three hundred, and. But I think this kind of treatment can also be applied even if you already get into the state of uh, organ failure, because I think this treatment can uh, mitigate and reduce the uh, hyperinflammatory state and reduce the organ injury. So, but early, early as possible should be better, but you need to balance between too early and too late. But how long? For for the for the session, actually, um, I agree with the, the comment that sometimes we might think about to apply them more longer, but uh, in uh, in our case, we use for our that also in terms of the practical issue, but uh, again, we still don't have uh, the strong evidence uh, to support in terms of the timing, in terms of the timing, but at least for my opinion, I think we should. Uh, run the treatment at least four hours. But 